Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you very much for tuning in. This is a screencast-o-matic recording and presentation to give you the guided notes for political parties and voter behavior. For this part of the lesson, we're going to be looking at the roles and functions of political parties and understanding more about the roles that they play specifically in our democracy. Before we get started, please let me encourage you to open up to the correct part of today's lesson and to fill in any key content for the guided notes section. Remember that you can replay any part of this presentation that you might need for later on. Let's get started. So I think one of the first things that we have to establish here is a general definition of what political parties do. Political parties are just organizations that seek political power by electing people to office so that its positions and philosophy become public policy. So I guess in many ways you could look at political parties as being the institutions or organizations that try to get their people who reflect their ideologies and policy ideals in government to actually make them happen. But when you dig a little bit deeper, there are three parts to every political party that make it function in all levels of government. There's the party organization, which is basically the party professionals, you know, like the leaders and activists. And then there's the party in government. And of course, this refers to the members of the party who are actually holding public office in our government. And then, of course, there are the party and the electorate. When you think about the electric, in many ways, I guess you could say that's that's us, the ordinary people who identify as either Democrats or Republicans in the main. So as you can see, political parties serve different functions and roles at all different tiers of government. In many ways, just like federalism with the division of tiers, so too do political parties serve purposes at different levels of government as well. <clears throat> now, the role of political parties are definitely eclectic and dynamic. Political parties nominate candidates for public office. Political parties also inform and activate supporters. Political parties also believe in the bonding agent function, which is basically this construct of where it ensures that people that they nominate for office serve the people and the party well after they get elected, so that later on people can make associations with a person and a party and a record of success. Of course, with governing, you know, they actually want to see the policies put in place to help the people. Uh, political parties also serve as a watchdog, which basically means that they watch the other party to ensure that they are acting ethically and that they, in fact, can criticize their policies. Uh, if you look at the United States government, <clears throat> after every election, there are parties in the majority, parties in the minority, and, you know, the party that might have lost more seats in that election still has a role to play in our democracy. And that's the last point right here. Political parties basically just make democracy work because the more people that you have engaged in the democratic process, the better that is for democracy and people's voices to be heard to, of course, be conveyed into policy later on. Let's take a closer look at party systems. So as you're aware, the United States is a two-party system in our government, and most other democracies have a multi-party system. But what does this mean? Well, let's look at multi-party systems first. Multi-party systems are just coalitions, if you will, or different factions that need to work together to pass legislation and laws. So minor parties have an incentive to persevere in this type of party system setup and structure. Additionally, multi-party systems use proportional representation. So say, for example, in the British government, if you are one of the many major parties, you, of course, would vote, right? And in theory, the results would reflect that in the makeup of the legislative body. Additionally, governments tend toward instability in this type of situation. And when you think about it, it makes sense. The more parties that there are, the less likely that there is for things to maybe get done because you have to rely on consensus building to basically get anything passed. Uh, additionally, when we look at two party systems over here on the right, <clears throat> the fact is, is that they use a winner take all system. And this should be pretty easy for you to remember. In theory, this is the person who gets the most votes, wins the most seats, and therefore, of course, might be able to turn elections or government in that way. Uh, two party systems also, I guess you could say, rely off of the wasted vote construct, which basically means that if you vote third party, you're wasting your vote. And so it makes sense to either vote for one of the two major parties. And in our case, we're referring to, of course, Democrats or Republicans. And in this type of system, government tends towards stability. So in theory, in our democracy, we are rather stable in terms of our government. And we either know the outcome is either going to be okay, Democrats hold the majority or Republicans. Uh, there's, real no, there's really no room for upsets, if you will. <clears throat> also, policy changes in our form of government are small and incremental. And I guess in many ways that could be a good or bad thing. Um, so hear me out when I say this. Uh, you know, in theory, even though a lot of people are upset about the two-party system, this still allows us the chance to get things done, but nothing really overly dynamic as well because of our careful system of checks and balances. 
sometimes people would say that's petty partisan politics, but you know, in many ways, this is a healthy balance to limit uh, the major fads that might sweep through us at a certain period of time and to act more, uh, I guess you could say diplomatically and methodically on certain aspects and legislation. The two party system here. So why do we have two parties? Well, most of the founding fathers actually didn't want parties. And I think that you guys might have remembered learning about that before and years prior. They tended to look at the American electorate as maybe just factions. But the first two political parties, in fact, were the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. The Federalists were led by Alexander Hamilton, typically backed by, you know, big merchants, big government, uh, you know, strong executive supporting people, while the Anti-Federalists were led by Jefferson and people who believed in smaller government or state government and also people who wanted, you know, the agrarian farming uh, side of politics to be brought forth. But over the time, throughout America's history, we've seen many other parties come to rise too. Now, you don't necessarily need this for your notes, but just kind of listen to this short list. You had the Federalist Party, like I said, and then the Anti-Mason Party. Two minor anti-slavery parties appeared in the 1840s, like the Liberty Party and the Free Soil Party. Then later came the Greenback Party. Then the People's or Populist Party. Then the American Socialist Party and the Socialist Labor Party. So you might be wondering, okay, why does this really matter? <laughs> well, I'm, what I'm really trying to show you guys is that American politics is dynamic and always changing. And these parties, you know, at one point in time had traction. And so in many ways, this shows you the coming and going of political parties and policies, and I guess to some extent, fads too. So what is the promotion of the two-party system? How did it get this way? And why do we need two parties in America? Well, I guess you could look at it from a variety of different standpoints, but tradition, you know, we've been doing this now for quite some time. So two-party politics has been, you know, as old as the days long, if you will. Also, the electoral system is basically how we choose just one winner coming from a district or from an election. This makes elections pretty clear cut. Election laws also discourage third parties. Uh, for example, both parties work together to shape election laws that systematically exclude third parties from rising to power. Uh, additionally, the American ideological consensus is that many Americans do share the same basic ideals. And as much as Democrats and Republicans do disagree, there are a fair amount of universal philosophies and policies that both sides have. But this is also easy for us too. It's easy for the electorate. Only having to choose between two sides makes voting incredibly simple. And when you think about multi-party systems and multi-party states, sometimes voting in their types of democracies is not so simple and straightforward. So let's go look at the nature of political parties. What do these people actually do? Well, political parties are often unorganized and decentralized, and that might come to a surprise to you. However, when you dig a little bit deeper, political parties also serve many different purposes and functions across all forms of government. But let's start from the top and look at the presidency first. So typically, the president's party is the more solidly united and organized than the other major party, usually, in most cases. Uh, if you look at when Donald Trump first came to Washington, D.C., although a lot of people were not so sure, including Republicans, about his leadership style, over time, Republicans realized that they could really grapple onto his popularity and they could form a majority across forms of government. So the president is automatically the leader of that party. Now, the other party might be wondering, what about the minority? Well, they usually have not just one leader, but of course, a number of personalities within the party, usually competing with each other, uh, and they form a leadership group that defines the narrative for the country. So I guess you could say in many ways right now um, that the Democrats uh, have, of course, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and you know even some other people who are just as important, like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and some of these other people who are important for defining that narrative for their party. So let's go ahead and look at the nature of political parties right now. When you look at federalism and the division of power, the same could be said true with political parties. There are over half a million elected offices in the United States. And we talked about some of them before, from governor to, you know, councilman. But these offices are widely distributed over national, state, and local levels. And so therefore, it does help to be part of one of the two major parties when it comes to the voters voting for you or the other person. This makes them highly disunified and decentralized, like I stated, so the need to bind them together is really important. In fact, political parties serve a high purpose during the nominating process. Nominations are made within the parties and often lead to fighting inside the party, and this leads to decentralized parties. So, for example, if you recall, back when Donald Trump was first running for the Republican primary, I think there were like 16 other candidates, you know, there's a lot of people, and this kind of created a lot of chaos within the party because there's so many choices. But over time, when there are just two choices for you to choose from, no matter what level or tier of office, this makes voting a lot easier. 
let's go ahead and look at the deeper organization of political parties right now. At the national level, both major parties are composed of five basic elements. The National Convention, a National Committee, a National Chairperson, two Congressional Campaign Committees, and state and local parties. So before I delve deeper, I just want you guys to know something, that the fact is that political parties try their best to unify the party at all tiers of government to bring about a common brand, a common message, and a common purpose. Let's look at national conventions first. So a party's national voice meets in the late summer of presidential election years to choose the party's presidential and vice presidential candidates. And this, in this way, they try to unite the party and serve as a pep rally to election season. Now, if you were watching the news this past year, obviously conventions were a lot different because of COVID-19 and the pandemic. Uh, but in a normal election year for the presidency, uh, typically these conventions are huge. They last four days long. There's a lot of fireworks and confetti and, of course, speeches that really rally people to that party. And yes, even the other party watches them, too. Actually, conventions look like this. These are some great photographs that you might have seen before from previous elections at the presidential level. Well, what else do political parties do? Well, now let's look at the National Committee next. The National Committees are at the top and they're composed of representatives from each state and several territories. They, in theory, handle the party's affairs between conventions. And so they look at the nitty gritty in terms of the people running, the policies advocated for, and some of the different types of provisions that might be in upcoming legislation that should be advocated for by political party members. So they work on the campaign during the election years. That's no surprise, right? They have to raise a lot of money for advertisements and such and spread the word to get people to vote. But in off years, they work to strengthen the party by promoting unity, raising, like I said before, a lot of money and recruiting even more voters to vote their way. In fact, at the highest level, you might have heard about this, there's the RNC and the DNC. The RNC stands for Republican National Committee and the DNC stands for Democratic National Committee. That may not become too a, much of a surprise to you. However, there's something to be said about these high tiers of, of political party organizations. In fact, here are the two top people of their prospective political party committee. Uh, so Tom Perez is the head of the DNC, and Ronna Romney McDaniel is the head of the RNC. And these people are the national chairpersons. Now, they are not only the leaders of the national committee, but they're chosen to a four-year term at a meeting held right after the national convention. So in many ways, you could look at them like a president too for their parties, uh, but they are in charge of organizing the people, nominating the best people, and of course, getting more and more people to vote for their party. Now, the choice is nominated just by the chosen national candidate and ratified by the national committee. So not everybody gets to directly vote for who, of course, is the head of these committees like you and me. But if you are into politics and you want to be part of a political party committee one day, you could very much so have a voice in who becomes the head of your committee. But did you know that political parties also exist inside Congress as well? You see, each party has a campaign committee in each House of Congress, so the House and the Senate. They work to ensure that their party members keep their seats in Congress, and they try to fill the seats of retiring members who are leaving with members from their own party. Additionally, in both parties in both houses, these people are chosen by their colleagues and serve two-year terms. Now, you can imagine why political parties are important in Congress, right? Because this is where laws get passed at the national level. So if you want to see your philosophies and ideologies passed in the laws, you have to win more seats to get your ideas through. It kind of makes sense when you look at it that way objectively. Now let's look at the smallest level of government. Why do political parties matter when it comes to counties and local districts? Well, let me explain. Each state has a central committee and a state chairperson to work further the party's interest in the state. What this means is that much of what is done in the states is done by volunteers. Instead of big political party organizations who get paid pretty well, you have volunteers who play an important role. The local organizations vary widely, but usually follow the electoral map. Now, as you can see here to your right, with all the red and blue in the bottom map, that shows you the electoral leanings of uh, politics in Pennsylvania. And so these little precincts, if you will, the smallest unit uh, of election administration, if you will, help us and help political parties try to identify, okay, uh, this is typically a blue county. I need to get more red voters to vote, to turn this county red, to put our person in office. That's basically what they look at. So oftentimes the local party organization is only active during presidential election years, but they try to get most people to turn up and turn out not only on election day, but maybe at town halls and debates and forums and also fundraisers as well for their candidates. So as you can see, both political parties have a lot 
to add to our democracy. But how did we get here? How did we become so divided as a nation? Please continue the next part of the lesson to explore more about the Republican Party and the Democratic parties accordingly. Remember, if you missed any of that content, you're welcome to go back and get that for your um, understanding. Good luck with completing the rest of the lesson, and thank you very much for tuning in.